guys, it's Miss Binion here for Roaring Twenties Part 2. So today we're going to cover three learning targets. Learning target 4.2, I can analyze the attacks on civil liberties and racial tensions. 4.3, discuss the growth of the Prohibition era. And 4.6, describe the changing status in women socially and economically. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to start with something that's kind of familiar to us. This um, something that occurred in the late 1800s, um, and that is nativism. And nativism is basically a belief that one's native land needs to be protected against immigrants. And these people are prejudiced toward foreign-born people, anybody who was born outside of the United States. And this is really evident in the rise of the KKK. Now, we've already talked about the KKK and um, how they rose in the Reconstruction era, but it's a new KKK with um, the rise in the 1920s. Um, so in the 1920s, the KKK is a lot different. Um, they are not just to get against African Americans, but Catholics, Jews, immigrants, and other groups that they thought were un-American. Um, and the popularity actually gets to about 4 million um, before it dies down at the end of the late 20s. And this also leads to a Red Scare, so the fear of communism. All right, the Red Scare is begun by the Russians. They had a revolution during World War I where they pulled out of the war, if you'll remember. Um, and America is afraid that there's going to be a communist revolution in the United States. Um, and in 1919, um, there was a bombing by an anarchist. And so this is kind of happening. So why we call this the Roaring Twenties. There's a lot of like things that are happening that are uncertain. And um, there's this fear and prejudice towards Germans and immigrants and communists and, um, and anarchists, people who don't think the, and I'm putting quotes here, the American way. Um, and so that is going to lead to the Red Scare, um, which is going to lead to a passage of various sedition laws. And a sedition law is going to be something that um, makes it so that you can't talk about something. So just like the sedition laws we had in World War I, these laws would... Um, limit free speech. Um, specifically, we have the Palmer Raids. A. Mitchell Palmer, who was the U.S. Attorney General, um, he wanted to eliminate any radical influence. Um, and so this could be communism, anarchism, any of that. Um, and he jailed a lot of people. So they call them the raids because they went around and they just collected a bunch of people that were immigrants or that someone may have suspected that uh, they were communist or anarchist, and he jailed them, and he deported a lot of them. And most of the time, he did it without proof. So this is like a kind of like a witch hunt, trying to find these people who didn't fit into this American ideal. All right, and this is the case that he makes against um, the Reds or the communists. Okay, and I'm going to give you a second to read that and just be ready to discuss in class. All right, hit pause if you need to. Okay, so the other thing is um, that, you know, we talked about old immigrants and new immigrants, but there's really not a lot of laws at that time about immigration. So in 1921, um, they come up with a new law, which leads to uh, another new law, Immigration Act of 1924. Um, so this basically limits the annual number of immigrants from a nation to 2% of the number of immigrants living in the U.S. in, the 18, in 1890. So the immigration quotas are based on the ethnic composition of the country more than 30 years before. And uh, this is before the heavy wave of immigration from the southern and eastern, um, from southern and eastern Europe and Asia. So really what this does is discriminate people from those areas. Uh, the new quotas deliberately favored immigrants from northwestern Europe uh, because there was more people living here at that time. Um, so this framework is going to kind of stay in place for the next 40 years. So this is going to kind of lead to a nativist America. So most immigration from Asian nations are going to stop. Okay, so specifically this is going to lead to this, um, you know, nativism. Um, anybody who was not American or um, from America or had a different belief, you know, it was not safe because um, Seiko and Benzetti are two, are two of these cases. Um, in April, April 15th, 1920, Two men robbed and murdered two employees of a shoe factory in Massachusetts. So the police arrest these two, but the evidence was questionable, such as Seiko owned a gun similar to the murder weapon, and the bullets that were used in the murder matched those in his gun, but the evidence wasn't, um, it was questionable. So um, it was, and it was circumstantial. So these guys, because they're anarchists and because they're immigrants, they, um, they, you know, people were prejudiced against them, and uh, there's not 
any evidence to indicate that they did it, but they're sentenced to death. And after six years of appeals, they end up dying. Um, and so is it because they actually did the crime or is it because they act they were immigrants and anarchists? They were both executed in 1927. And you use them as an example of what is happening, um, anti-immigrant bias. So the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, like I said, promotes 100% Americanism. They oppose all of these people and they also, um, their membership, like at this point, you can see the difference here is this guy doesn't have his face covered, whereas in the old pictures, they had their face covered. They're out and they're proud about their, um, their 100% Americanism. Okay, so, prohibition. So, we all know prohibition is the um, amendment that stopped the sale and drinking of alcohol. So, here are some successes and failures from that. Um, so, you may want to write these down. Um, Public drunkenness, arrests decline, deaths from alcoholism um, decrease. However, the failures are, and the biggest one I want to point out here is the rise of organized crime. Um, people are still going to sell alcohol on the black market. And, like, it's just going to make crime much worse in the 1920s, okay? Um, there are several fundamentalist preachers during this time. Um, so while it's a very, like, changing culture, there's also this culture of bringing it back to, like, where it started, and so um, bringing it back to Christian morals, and that also is going to fuel the debate over creationism versus evolution. Okay, so origins um, of prohibition, going back to or prohibition, um, that starts in the Andrew Jackson era, okay? We've already talked about the Anti-Saloon League, the Temperance League, Women's Christian Temperance Union. All of these are... Uh, groups that wanted to stop alcohol. And after World War I, um, there became more state and local prohibition laws. Um, and then that's going to lead to the 18th Amendment, right before the 19th Amendment. And this shows that after one year from the ratification of this article, so they had one year to prepare, uh, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof or the exportation thereof um, is subject, it's prohibited. Okay, so you can't drink it, can't sell it, can't do anything with it. Okay, and the Volstead Act came after that, and this is known as the National Prohibition Act. So it came with the prohibition law, um, and basically it defines what an intoxicating liquor is. Like, was it rubbing alcohol, or how much alcohol had to be in a substance for it to be intoxicating liquid? And if you were caught drinking or you're caught selling, then uh, there's violations for those acts. And that leads to the rise of speakeasies, establishments that sold illegal liquor. They're very profitable. They also called them blind pigs. And a lot of the law enforcement could be bribed to keep these quiet or um, to call ahead and say, hey, someone's gonna, someone's coming and they're going to rat you out or the police are coming. And so everybody would have time to put, to clear up the speakeasy. So speakeasy is basically like an underground, um, it's an underground bar. And it started with one lady who was selling it and she would say, speak easy, like don't talk about alcohol, speak in a different language. So that's where that came from. And basically, there had to be, like, this is going to cost a lot of money. So people are losing money off the sale of alcohol, and it's costing the government money. There's a Bureau of Prohibition. It's going out there and trying to find people, organized crime, that are selling um, or smuggling in uh, alcohol or bootlegging alcohol. And enforcement is just basically impossible. Um, use of alcohol for medicinal and religious purposes was still legal. And that brings us to our last of today, Chicago furniture dealer, Al Capone. That was his, like, job, and I say that in quotes. Um, and basically, he headed the Chicago, like, the biggest organized crime of this uh, era. And um, he was believed to have masterminded what we call St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and I'll show you a clip of that in class. Um, they always try to convict Al Capone, try to get him, um, it, get him arrested for alcohol, but they never could, and they finally got him, they finally arrested him for income tax evasion. And then the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, like I said, I'll show you a clip of, it's basically the murder of seven members in a rival gang. And um, this, when this happens, you know, it's just kind of like any almost terrorist type thing. It turns people away from um, organized crime. And they're trying to uh, get the 18th Amendment repealed so that organized crime does not occur anymore. Okay, so... That then now bring us to the repealing of the 18th Amendment 
an election issue in 1928 and 1932. The 21st Amendment is ratified in 1933, so after the Roaring Twenties. And it repeals the 18th Amendment. All right, and that's it for today. I'll talk to you guys later. See you in class. Bye.